Let's give the Lord some praise this morning. Could you just remain standing just for a moment? And uh, there we go. There we go. There's power in the house of the Lord. Somebody say amen. I don't know about you as we were singing that song. Can I ask you this? And you don't have to answer it out loud. But have you ever been forgotten or left behind or walked out on or betrayed uh, or experienced a, a failure or a setback? And can I tell you this? What I love about the praise we just declared is it reminds us that in this world, we'll be disappointed. In this world, we will make mistakes. But there is one. His name is Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. The scripture describes him as he's the one that sticks closer than a brother. He, he's the one who declared who will never leave us or forsake us. He is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to seek the one who is lost. He is the father ready to receive the prodigal who has wandered in sin. And so it is so easy for us as the people of God and the place of God on a place like today to lift a praise where we declare that we trust him. Do you trust him, church? We trust the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you and we are so thankful to be here today. God, it is a joy, a deep and tremendous joy to be in this place with the people of God. It is a privilege this morning to lift up praise to you, Lord, because you're worthy of it. God, it is our desire, as we've declared and sung this morning, to build our life on you, the, the firm foundation, the one who will not leave us, the one who will not fail us, the one who will not forsake us. And now, Lord, as your people, we're coming together and we're going to your word. It's true, Lord. We, we need it this morning. God, I pray as we go to your word that it will convict what needs convicting. Lord, that it will correct what needs correcting. Lord, that it will encourage us when our souls are cast down. Lord, that it will... It will spur us on to good works and gospel ministry. And God, as your people, we will claim the promise together this morning that as your word goes out, it will not return empty. And that's a good word for us, Lord, because we need to be filled up this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen. As you're being seated, put your hands together and give the Lord praise one more time. He is... Worthy. I'm so thankful to be here today. I feel like I need to say this very quickly up front uh, because many of you who attend uh, Trinity at our Hammond location every week, some of you right now, you're going, hey, who in the world is this guy who's on the stage talking to us? And uh, if we have not met before, my name is Daniel Riddick. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity. I have the privilege week in and week out. Uh, of pastoring our Oakleaf location. And uh, this is, a, all right, Oakleaf. We've got a lot of Oakleaf people in the house today. Uh, this is a special week, unique season of transition for us. Uh, last week, we thought might have been the only week we were gonna combine together. Um, we needed uh, uh, to do it one more week this week as they're finalizing and, and putting uh, the finishing work on our, our building. As much as I love being here, had the privilege of preaching at our classic service at 9 a.m. I know Tommy was in here at 9. And I love being with you at 1045. I'll tell you, I do not want to see you next week, all right? Uh, Lord willing. Uh, we are going to be doing some kind of gathering at our new building, a preview service, uh, and we are excited. We're getting ready to grand open the building uh, with, with services open to the community on Easter weekend. And so this morning, uh, I am so thankful uh, to be with you to share the word of God. Pastor Tom, uh, if you're a regular attender or you're a guest of our Hammond location, I'd encourage you to be back next week. Pastor Tom, Pastor Tommy, uh, they'll be here like normal uh, next week. Uh, but we're going to finish up a series that we have been in together across all three of our Trinity campuses over uh, the last five weeks in the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles and you want to jump ahead, we'll get to the scripture in just a moment. But uh, Nehemiah, uh, kind of right there, maybe in the, the middle of the Old Testament, you can begin to open uh, up your Bibles there or on your phone. And you see three words. I love these, these subtitles, these themes of rebuilding and restoring and, and renewing. 
This will be the fifth week we've talked about what it looks like when the people of God engage in the work of God and that among them and in them and through them, God begins to do a work of rebuilding what has been broken, restoring what has been uh, uh, tor torn apart, re renewing what felt like it was, it was dead. And in so many ways, the themes of this book they, they resonate and God has given them to us for the purpose of seeing life change and transformation among his people. It, just to give you a little context, uh, in the Old Testament there are two companion books. They're side by side in the Old Testament, Ezra and, and Nehemiah. Ezra is focused on the, the building, uh, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem uh, for worship. And then Nehemiah is, is focused on rebuilding the, the wall. And if you've been around our church for the last number of weeks, we've been oh, looking at the, the work of the people of God given uh, the project that they had been assigned to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. I, I love this building theme. Everybody say the word building. In fact, it's so good, and God orchestrates this because we, I did not talk to him about this, but what Carson said, the scripture that he read to us this morning, illustrates this truth, this building theme. You find it all throughout scripture that God is a building God. God is a creator. God is doing a, a work. God des desires to see transformation among the, the lives of, of his people and this building theme gives us this powerful picture of what it looks like for a group of people to be deeply engaged in the work of God and on his mission. Hey, I'll tell you this, that following the Lord, your life in Jesus Christ, it is not designed to be a spectator sport. Somebody say amen. God desires to you to be active in his work. He has a mission and he has a purpose and a, and a, and a plan for you. I've said this every week over the last number of weeks, but as we read Nehemiah, it gives us this pattern for what it looks like to see both social reform and spiritual renewal in a community. This is the missional focus of God's people. God has placed his people in a place, in a community, in a neighborhood, and he desires not only for his people to be changed, but he desires to see his work, the kingdom of God, advance in a place. I'll tell you the other thing, and this is so encouraging and deeply personal. Nehemiah gives hope. Everybody say the word hope. Hope's one of those things I just don't think we can talk enough about. Hope's an idea that I don't think we can get uh, uh, enough of. And as we see Nehemiah and the people of God engage in what was a difficult work, the walls were broken down and burned. The city was in disrepair. We, we've taught through it. There, there, was, uh, there was opposition. There, there was real discouragement. And can I tell you this? When you get serious about following the Lord, when, when you get serious about seeing God begin to do work in your life, I'm telling you, at times, it can be difficult. Can anybody testify to that? And, and yet, at the same time, here's the good news. This is the gospel that we see in the Old Testament, that God is a God who rebuilds. God is a God who restores. God is a God who renews. And so when we see the work in Nehemiah, about the rebuilding work, it's a reminder to us that when God is for you, who can be against you? That God desires to see a good work and transformation among his people. Where we'll end today, and I'm excited about this message, we'll end today with what I would describe as a, a surprising conclusion. Uh, if, you, if you read the, the, the story it seems like there's an obvious conclusion and then you find out what you thought the story was about is not what it's really about. H has anybody had that experience where you were watching a TV show or a movie and like you thought you understood where the story was going and then there was like a hard turn somewhere along the way? Over the summer I was watching, uh, somebody told me to, to, to watch this, this show. I'm not gonna tell you what it is because I don't wanna spoil anything for you, but I was watching this kind of sci-fi themed show, multiple episodes, and I got into it and uh, the first episode, there's this, this lady, husband and wife, but it really focuses on this lady 
And it's very interesting, and, and she's uncovering this big conspiracy. And I'm telling you, I mean, I was locked in. And you, you know how, like, on Netflix and all these things now, it's like when one episode ends, it, like, just starts playing the second episode. And so I'm all in. I'm like, wow, she's really uncovering something crazy, and this is getting wild. And so the second episode starts, and I thought, well, I got to see what happens to her next. And I'm thinking, I know there's about 10 episodes in this series. I'm like, wow, I'm wondering where she's going to take us. And then I think at the beginning of the third episode, she is killed off. And I thought the whole show was about her, and then I find out, oh, actually, this is about something else. For four weeks, we've been reading Nehemiah, and they've been working on building the wall, right? And so if you're a logical thinking person, then you think the conclusion, the pinnacle, the climax of the story is what? They finish the wall. The whole thing's about building the wall, then the conclusion of the story must be that the wall is completed. And good news, the wall is completed, but the story doesn't stop there. What we actually discover, what we actually discover is that this work of rebuilding was not just to rebuild a wall, but that God was rebuilding a people. The, the work in Nehemiah was not just that God was restoring a city, but he was ready to bring restoration to a, a people. That God wasn't just renewing the, the gates of the city, but he was ready, ready to bring real and lasting renewal to his people. And so in Nehemiah chapter 8, on the other side of the completed wall, God's not finished yet. And somebody look to your neighbor right now and say, God's not finished. God's not finished. The, the work was bigger than the wall, and they conclude with this time of powerful worship. I'll read just a few verses for you. You can follow along with me if you'd like to. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 says this. It says, and uh, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate, and they asked the scribe Ezra. I told you Nehemiah and Ezra companion books. This is the first time Ezra appears in Nehemiah. And it says, they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, think the word of God, the easiest way to think about that, that the Lord had given Israel. And on the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding. And while he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out from it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand, verse three says this, and all the people, they listened attentively to the book of the law, and then jump ahead for the sake of time, look at verse six, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said amen and amen, and then they knelt low, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hey, can I give us a principle as we begin this morning? And I, I'd encourage you, let's lean in on this together. That the, the outcome of engaging deeply in God's work and the work that he's called us to is that we ultimately might have a greater sense of God's presence and our lives would be in alignment with his truth and his word. I, I'm gonna say that one more time because I don't want us to miss, miss it. The, the work is not the end in itself. It's the means to an end. And the outcome of deeply engaging in the work that God has called you to is so that you can know him, so that you can experience his presence in your life, so, so that you can, you can align your life with his, with his truth. Hey, can I be real practical? The, the, the sum total of the Christian experience and what it means to, to follow God is not just to show up for an hour on Sunday morning. As important and critical as it might be, it's not simply to perform an act of service in, the, in some area of the, of the church. By the way, I mean, I feel this so deeply right now, and it's like the Lord was just stepping on my toes all week. Because here I am in our church at Oakleaf, we're literally in this act of, of building this building, and I'll tell you the thought that had begun to creep into my mind, that the whole goal was just the completed construction of a building. 
And can I tell you this? That's not the end game. If we build a church, but we don't meet with God, then we've missed it. If we gather together and we meet together, but we don't meet with the Lord, then we've missed it. And and so Nehemiah engages the people in building the wall, but it doesn't stop there. God meets with them in what I would call the experience of revival. Let me give you the whole sermon in one sentence, a big idea. If you have your hand out, this is a good place to follow along. As the people of God engaged in the work of God, I think it's time beginning today that we begin to prepare for revival. We begin to pray for revival. We begin to desire and long for the the presence of God. You say, Pastor Daniel, what is revival? What what, what is revival, number one, the nature of of revival? Now, I'm gonna gonna do a throwback real quick, and I've talked about this before at Oak Leaf, but I know everybody's story is not like my story, but I would imagine a lot of you in this room, just by the nature of where we are, the history of our church, the geography of Jacksonville, Florida, a lot of us have have grown up in and around church in the South. I grew up uh, uh, in a Baptist church uh, all my life. You know, you've heard the phrase, and this was my life, we went to church every time the doors were open. Somebody say amen if you were there. Whether I wanted to be there or not, my parents drug me to church every weekend. I'm thankful for it. And we had revival. Anybody been to a revival at a church before? You know what revival was? It was something that we put on our calendar. Maybe it happened in the fall. Maybe it happened in the spring. And when I was a young child and I knew revival was coming, I just remember thinking it just meant I was going to have to go to church a lot more than usual. We were going to have services on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday night and Tuesday night, and, uh, and you know, I mean, we, we were meeting all the time. I, and by the way, I thought we did a lot. I got to Trinity uh, 20 years ago. We were still doing uh, this thing, Bible conference. We'd have two preachers a night. Can you believe that? And I mean, so we're just scheduling it. We're going, now here's what I also thought revival meant. I, I equated revival with potlucks and dinner on the ground. Somebody say amen. Let's bring that back, right? I'm good, I mean, if you want me to be happy, just somebody make a good, you know, church casserole, that's all I need. Revival was this event, and there was a guest preacher, maybe revival was about a person, and it was about a schedule, but when you come to the word of God and you see God move and you see his presence and you see his power, can I tell you this? It's not something that you can orchestrate or plan or, 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 or organize. In fact, let me say it to you this way. Revival, don't miss this, is not something the church does. It's something that God does in his church. Revival is not something the church does. It's something that God does among his people, and may he do it today. Revival is what happens when the renewing work of the Holy Spirit, everybody say renewing. The renewing work of the Holy Spirit is unleashed on his people. Verse three, I love this description. It says this, that all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Uh, In other words, there's this idea that they begin to kind of wake up to the word of the Lord. They, they, they begin to kind of come alive to the reality that God had truth for them. Revival, when we experience it, has both a renewing and it has an awakening effect. It's when the people of God who have become sleepy, who have become sluggish, who have become apathetic and have been going through the the religious routines of the the week in and week out, all of a sudden when we wake up. Now, you know, it's interesting, we have even named some previous and historic revivals that have moved through our country 200 years ago. You know, we called them the great what? The great awakening. You, you recognize that when the Spirit of God moves in a unique way, it wakes us up from our religious slumber. Revival is not only a renewing work of the Holy Spirit among his people, but it, it is an intensifying work of the Holy Spirit, not only among his people, but among those who are far from God. 
It says this in verse three that, that while he was facing the square in front of the water gate, hey, can I just say this as an aside? This was not happening inside the walls of the temple, was it? This was happening out in the community. This was happening at the, at the town square. And by the way, some of the great revivals and crusades that God has used in the course of human history have not been under the roofs of churches. They've been in, in fields and in stadiums and, and in parking lots. God is interested in his revival in the, in the community and in a city and, and among a people. And it says this, that they weren't just in church for a little bit. But it says, verse three, that while he was in the square, he read out of the law from daybreak until noon. Now, now the, the, the Jewish day ran from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we got some math majors in the room today. If I start reading the law of God from daybreak until noon, how many hours is that, math majors? How many hours is it? Six, some of you weren't very confident about that. Six hours, six hours. This was an unusual move of God as the word was read. They, they stood there for hours and they, and they, and they soaked it in. How, how much does it stand in contrast with our usual weekend experience? My kids, and they, they, they love me, I know that. At least I, I choose to believe that every day. And my, my son, he's almost 16. My daughter's uh, 13 in junior high school. And you know, every now and then, uh, you preach and you're in church week in and week out, and you're kind of looking for a little affirmation. You're looking for a little encouragement, and you kind of think to yourself, if I'm gonna get affirmed and encouraged somewhere, it's gotta be the people in my own home, right? And I'll come home from, from church on a Sunday morning, and I'll look uh, at my son and I'll look at my daughter and I'll say, hey, how'd you feel about the message today? You know what their number one description of my preaching over the course of the last 10 years has been? Too long. <laughs> you went too long. You, you see in Nehemiah, think about this. The move of God so enraptured the hearts and minds of the people that for six hours they heard the word. You see, can I tell you what I desire? Don't get me wrong, the Holy Spirit's doing what he's gonna do. The Holy Spirit is always and already convicting people. Somebody say amen if you know that's true. The Holy Spirit is always and already converting people and those who are lost are found in Jesus. Somebody say amen. The Holy Spirit is always and already assuring people, sanctifying people, growing people, but when revival come, it's in a unique intensification of that work. We just finished a basketball season uh, here, here at Trinity. My son plays basketball, and, and, and basically, I'll sum up basketball, and here's how you play it. There's, there's two parts to it. There's offense, you try to score, and there's defense. You try to keep the other team from scoring. There's a lot more to it, but I could sum it up that way. There's offense, and there's defense. And offense and defense is played the entire game, no matter what. You're trying to score, you're trying to keep the other team from scoring, but occasionally during the game, I watched a lot of basketball over the last couple of months. Occasionally during the game, the coach will say something like this. They'll, they'll make a call, they'll give a signal, and they'll put the team into what they call a full court press. Do you know what a full court press is? It's defense, and they've already been playing defense, but it's defense at another level. It, it, it's defense pressed in for a unique purpose at a unique time for un, a, a unique reason. And here's what I'm saying when I read Nehemiah chapter eight and, and chapter nine, you see this experience of revival, and it's this full court spiritual press, and all I'm saying, church, is I long for it and we need it. It's the, it, it, it's the description of revival. So what's the secret to revival? What happens among the people that, that it causes them for six hours to, to stand enraptured by the word of God? Two things, I'll give it to you quickly. Revival comes from a desire to honor, everybody say the word honor, honor God's word. Re re revival comes from a desire to honor God's word. Verse four, I love the description in scripture 
because not only does it describe the scene and give us this vivid mental image, but it actually communicates the purpose and the principle of what it looks like to honor the word of God. Verse four says this, then Ezra, who is the scribe, he stands up and it says this, on a high wooden platform, and Ezra opened the book, here's the description, in full view of all the people, and it says since he was elevated above everyone, and then as he opened it, it says the people stood up. Now can I give you those words? And I want you to think about the honoring of the word. The word was high, it was in full view, plain to understand, it was elevated, and the people in response, it says they stood up, that's, that's honor. In fact, one writer would say this, it's in Nehemiah chapter eight and nine that God's people finally became a people of the, of the book. Do, do you know, we actually experience this culture of honor, probably in a lot of ways, but particularly in two pretty common life occurrences, in, in, in weddings, in funerals, as a pastor, I have the opportunity to be a part maybe of more of those than the average person. And you experience it every time at a funeral. Sometimes the family will come in or sometimes as the family's leaving. And you know what, everyone, almost instinctively, I mean sometimes they give you an instruction but it almost happens automatically. Do you know what happens as the family arrives or as the family leaves for those in the audience? You stand. You say, what are you doing? You're recognizing the importance for, for the person who was lost. You're reverencing the memory of who they were. You're demonstrating a care and compassion for their family. You honor them by standing. In, in a wedding, many of you, probably everybody in here has experienced this. At some point in a traditional wedding, the, the doors swing open and, and, and down, the, down the aisle, the bride appears. And again, almost without instruction, what does everybody do when the bride appears? They stand, why? In, in respect, in reverence, in appreciation, in care, in honor. That when, when you honor something, it moves to a place of priority in your life. I'll tell you what else it does. I thought about this when it comes to weddings and funerals. They're also usually a disruption into the ordinary daily work of life, right? I, I, got, a, I got a text uh, this past week. Bonnie's here this morning. She texted me, and her, her son's getting married, and she said, hey, would you do the wedding? And she gave me the date, and I replied back pretty quick and said, I think that'll work. And I looked at my calendar, and I saw the date, and, and uh, it was a Saturday, and it's a, a, about an hour away, and I thought two things. I thought, I'm so happy to do this. I'm gonna be honest to you, Bonnie, right now. I thought, and this is not what I had planned on that Saturday. You, you know what happens when we get serious about honoring? It's a disruption. It, it, it says, it says the, or, or the, the word of God, and, and when we honor the word, it should be a disrupting force in our life. It, it, it moves in and it shakes up the ordinary. The, the word of God comes in and it begins to, to transform and, and minimize some things and elevate other things. So revival comes when we honor the word. Here's the second principle. Revival comes when we desire to obey. Everybody say the word obey. God's word. I won't belabor this because you're so smart and intelligent and you get it. It doesn't need much explanation, but sometimes we have to state the obvious. Verse 14, it says this. They heard the law. They saw what the Lord had commanded. Verse 15, and so they proclaimed and spread this news. They literally responded to what they heard. Hey, can I give us a principle this morning? Maybe the greatest mark of real revival is simple obedience to the word of God. That we hear what the word of God says and then we, what church, and then we, we do it. We hear the word of God and then we do it. Every parent knows what it's like to only live on one side of that, right? You ever had that experience with with your kids or maybe even your grandkids, you give them an, an instruction, hey, clean your room, hey, get in the shower, hey, do your homework, hey, come, come for dinner. And then you know what they do, and this is crazy, they acknowledge that they heard you. Okay, yes ma'am, yes sir. And then what you think is gonna happen next does not happen. 
You wait patiently and no one comes. You don't hear the water in the shower kick on. They don't come get their backpack to start the homework. And so you say it again. Hey, take a shower, do your homework, come eat dinner. And you know what they do? Crazy. I hear you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And then what? And then you wait. And I have had this experience with, with my kids. And I walk in and I say, you need to do. And I repeat it again. And you know what they say? I heard you the first time. And you know what I'm ready to do? I won't tell you what I'm ready to do at that moment. But I'm, I get to the place, and you know what I'm, I'm realizing? I don't want you just to hear it. I want you to do it. That sounds like something, doesn't it? That sounds like a New Testament scripture, doesn't it? That we're not supposed to just be hearers of the word, but, but doers. Now, I'm going to confess to you. I'm going to be honest with you, because church is a good place to be honest. I've been in church for a long time. I've been around the church. I, I, I serve and, and, and minister with a wonderful group of people at Oak Leaf every week, and I believe this is true here. You know, the church is, the church is filled with incredible hearers. I mean, I love to preach. You know why? Because the people love to hear. I, I, I love to hear preaching. You know why? Because I love to hear. Do you know what separates us from the routine religious experience and revival, it's when the hearing becomes doing. We honor the word and we obey it. Here's the third thing, we'll end with this very quickly, and this, is, this to me is powerful, this is what I'm praying for, this is what we long for as a church, the signs of, of revival number three. The signs of revival. Here's the first one. There's gonna be a recovery of what I would call the gospel or a recovery of the reality of our salvation. Interesting what happens, and it's a little bit unusual, but in, in, verse, in verse 17, they hear this, they're reading this command of the Lord, and they come across these verses in the law that talk about the people celebrating what's called the, the, the Feast of Booths or the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says this in verse 17, the whole community that had returned from exile, they literally built these little shelters and they made shelters and they lived with them. I brought, I brought this with me. I think we got something back here, right here. Here we go. And so now this, they, this would have been much larger and more, uh, uh, you know, more elaborate, but imagine this for a moment. God tells his people, and, and this is gonna sound very odd to our modern sensibilities, but let's go with it. God tells his people, Go build a tent and live outside for a week. And here's what you're going to do. You're gonna remember how you and your, your, your great, 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 great grandfathers and grandmothers spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness in tents and then finally, because of my goodness, my grace, my mercy, my salvation, I brought my people from the wilderness into the what? Into the, the promised land. And so here's what the Lord says to them, and here's what they do. We're gonna remember where we came from. We're, we're gonna remember when we were lost and wandering. We're, we're gonna remember because of the brokenness of our sin and disobedience, we were in the wilderness. We're gonna remember the bondage and slavery of Egypt, and we're gonna stay in this tent, but here's the good news. We're no longer living in the tent anymore. Somebody say amen. In Jesus Christ, We've been given this gift of salvation. We, we've been brought into the promised land. We have been restored. We have been renewed. And can I tell you, when revival happens, it's when you realize where we were, but because of Jesus, this is where I am now. I, I realized where I was, I was lost. I realized where I was, I was enslaved. I realized where I was, I was wandering without purpose, but now because of Jesus, I am found. Now, I, I'm gonna give you my application of what God did in my life. I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit in my life. You know what the Spirit convicted me of this week? That I spend too much of my life living like I'm still in the tent, for, for, forgetting the joy of my salvation going on in my own strength and my own frailty and my own brokenness when God's given me through his son Jesus Christ a new life, a new power, a, 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 new, a new hope. Think about all of these images. Dead to life, old to new, darkness to light. What was broken 
has been put back together. Do you, do you know when revival comes? When we are overwhelmed and living in the power of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Can I tell you what erupts when you get equipped and filled up and reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Worship. And here, here's the second thing. You know, the sign of revival is this. There, there will be anointed corporate worship. Chapter 9, verse 3 says this. And then they spent another fourth of the day. All right, math majors in the room, remember? We're in, we're in the Word from daybreak into noon. How many hours? Six, all right. And then a fourth of the day, if there was a 12-hour day, that means they spent how long? How many hours? Three. Three hours in what? Here's verse three, in confession and worship of the Lord their God. Do, do you know what happens when I've experienced life change in Jesus? I remember what Christ has done for me. I confess and I worship. The, the, the scripture says that God inhabits the what? The praise of his people. The, the, the presence of God fills this place when we're a people who because we've been changed by the gospel, we're no longer in the tent, we're living the life of the promised land. Now we confess and we, we worship, and then here's where it ends, and I love this. And, and you say, well, how do you know you're really experiencing revival? There will be an overwhelming sense of joy. Everybody say the word joy. Verse 10, I love this, we'll end with this. Nehemiah says, today, is holy to our Lord. And then he says this, do not grieve. Now I know this, I know that life is hard. I know that you've really walked a difficult road of pain and suffering at times. I know there is real brokenness in this world. I know our relationships have not all been reconciled and restored. I know some of us are living in physical sickness and hurt and difficulty, but, but here's the good news. In the Lord, he says, you don't have to grieve. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. When your body is failing you, when your relationships are failing you, when your career is failing you, when your finances is failing you, he says this, in the Lord, there's still a strength available to you. Do not grieve. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 17, and there was tremendous joy. I read that verse this week, and God flooded the idea of this hymn that I sang growing up as a child. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplies every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' free, uh, feet, I am free. Yes, free indeed. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing. I am saved, somebody say amen, from the awful gulf of sin. I have found that hope so bright and clear, living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near, I can see his smiling face. I have found the joy, no tongue can tell, how its waves of glory roll. It's like a great and overflowing well springing up within my soul. And then the writer says this, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. Hey church, can I take us right back to where we started? The whole sermon in one sentence, here it is. The end of the story was not that the wall was built. The end of the story was not simply that people had done the work. The end of the story was not that they had just prepared and planned, but the end of the story, here it is, was revival God met with his people. And this morning, this is what I'm praying for, and this is what I want to invite us to, even as we respond this morning, that we might meet with the Lord. We're, we're here today, but that's not the only reason why we, we, we gather. We, we, you may have served today, but that's not the only reason you're in this place today. We're together as the people of God, yes, to meet together, but we want to meet with Him, and so let's be a people who are going to prepare for revival. Honor the Lord. And maybe in your life today, 
it, it, it's time for this awakening. I, I'm convinced of this in multiple ways. There are people in this room this morning and, and what you really need isn't more church, although I want you to keep coming. What you need is spiritual breakthrough. What, what you need isn't more hearing, what you need is some doing. What, what, what you need is to honor the Word of God and to wake up to what God is doing. What we need to do is we need to be reminded of what Christ has done. We're no longer wandering the wilderness. We're living the joy of our salvation. So here's what I'm saying, church. Let's confess what needs to be confessed. Let's worship because God is, is worthy of it. And then let's experience together in this place today. And certainly as we leave, we don't want it to end. This is the beginning. The unspeakable, tremendous, overwhelming joy of the Lord. I, I'm going to invite you this morning. And it's, sometimes it's a good thing for us to move from there to here. And I'm going to invite you this morning to come and do business with the Lord as he leads in your life and pray for your family that God would continue the work of restoration, rebuilding, renewal, and revival in our church. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Father God, we love you, and we are so thankful for the truth of your word. God, we prayed at the beginning, and so, Lord, we're going to claim this promise together this morning. Your word's gone out, and now we pray, God, that you'd fill us up. God, I pray for those in this place today, maybe who do not know you as Savior. They've heard Jesus. They've been around the things of Jesus, but they've not given their life to Jesus. They're still in the wilderness. They're still wandering in the tent. God, we, we pray that today would be, as the Scripture says, the day of salvation. Because of the death of Christ and his powerful resurrection, by grace and in faith, Lord, I pray that some in here today, Lord, would meet you for the first time. Lord, I pray with and for and over so many of my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning who just need a spiritual breakthrough. God, would you give it to them today? God, would you, would you meet with them today? Would you show up and show out in their life in a special way today? God, for those who are, who are journeying the difficult work of rebuilding and, and desiring restoration, God, would you give them hope today? Lord, as we kneel before you, God, may we hear your truth, but then, God, may we be doers of it. Confess our sin, worshiping the Lord, and God, would you fill this place, fill this moment, fill our song as we sing it with your overwhelming and tremendous joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Church, I'm going to invite you. Don't wait. Let's respond to what the Lord is doing. Lift your voice and praise. This altar is